Welcome in, everyone, to our Buckeyes edition that we present here each and every week at the Voice of College Football OSU. So if you have yet to subscribe, please do that because we can't bank on the time each and every week. A lot going on between these two and Kevin Noon. So again, it's typically Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time. But please hit that bell for the notifications to know when we go live to keep up with us. We got Steve Hellwagon on board, of course, from Bucknuts 247 Sports. And down below, Tony Gerdeman, Buckeye Weekly, Buckeye Huddle, and uh, the College Football Playbook. How's that uh, coming along here on YouTube? Still working on building up that subscribership so we can really start to unleash uh, the content there. But things are going well. Now's the time to actually start. You know, football is over. So now there's actually time to do stuff. And the time when it's football and basketball together is uh, the worst time of the year. And so you, you lose football and now you can have some time to do some other things. Steve, good to see you today. Um, Ohio state, uh, exchanged quarterbacks per se this week. And I don't know if it was much of a exchange. I don't know if it worked out too well for him, but CJ Stroud, after all the speculation and all the efforts to try to keep him around. And there must've been some decision-making process there because he waited until, pretty much the end of the line to declare for the NFL draft when that's usually the time when the fourth and fifth rounders are deciding, okay, which is a, a better option, not a top five pick in the NFL draft, but CJ Stroud finally makes his decision or makes his decision known. And one Tristan Jebbia is making his way from Corvallis and the other OSU. Yeah. Um, a development of some regard, I think, uh, obviously, Ohio State goes into spring football this year with two guys, uh, Kyle McCord, who is a sophomore currently, and Devin Brown, who's a freshman. And there's two years of separation between them because McCord didn't play enough to break his redshirt year, I don't believe, this year. So uh, that's a good thing, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I look at it, and I think that this kind of falls under the category of what we saw a few years ago with uh, – Chris Chuganoff, who came from uh, West Virginia, Gunnar Hoke, who maybe have come from Kentucky. These are veteran journeyman type quarterbacks who have been career backups, maybe gotten a little bit of run here and there, you know, got to start a few games, maybe when somebody was hurt or uh, just when a program was between guys or that type of thing. Never been the guy at a, a pro, you know, a power five program, but have been in the mix and have practiced at the highest level and uh, played at least a few games against the best competition out there. So I think that uh, this is a common sense move by the coaches. We had people on our message board who were like, this is Ohio State. They should be able to go out and get somebody better than this. And it's like, no, you don't understand. I think anybody who is rationally has a rational brain who's been around college football like this uh, Gebbia kid has been for five or six years, understands that all of the eggs for Ohio State are in the basket of Kyle McCord and Devin Brown. And they have recruited two national top 100 quarterbacks. And those guys are going to be given every opportunity to win the job. And it's kind of like, you know, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, know your role. You know, your role in this whole scenario is to uh, be there uh, to show up on time, to learn the offense, to help coach the young guys, uh, to throw passes in practice to Marvin Harrison and whoever needs passes thrown to them, and be there in a pinch. If something were catastrophically to happen to one or both of those guys, then maybe uh, this Getty character would get uh, uh, Gebbia. I can't even get his name right. I apologize. And I apologize. I, I'm just terrible on names. Um, he would be pressed into service at that point. So he's a stopgap in uh, in all likelihood. I mean, they have Lincoln Keenholz coming in from South Dakota this summer. He'll be, you know, a late addition to the class uh, committed in, in December after visiting for the uh, Michigan game and decommitted from Washington. Sounds like he's a, a quality player from all, you know, aspects, but uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, they, they don't want to rush him along and put him in a situation where they're depending on a true freshman if it came to it. So 
Uh, this guy gives them some insurance and uh, is there in a pinch. And from his standpoint, he gets the thrill of playing for, again, a team that uh, I just posted a story yesterday, Mark, <clears throat> where I took – all of the uh, way too early top 25 lists from, as we like to say, the Dodds and the 40s and the Schleybaws and all those guys, you know, the, the luminaries of our sport who come out in the wee hours after Georgia trounces TCU 62 to 7 and they put up their top 25 for the following year. And Ohio State, I think, was third or fourth, I think fourth on that list with the usual suspects, Georgia, Alabama, Michigan, Ohio State, in any order, uh, the different uh, lists uh, had them in different orders, obviously. But Georgia was the unanimous number one, even losing Stetson Bennett going into next year. But for this kid, Gabby, it's a thrill to come and play, uh, you know, and practice and be around, you know, meaningful college football games. I mean, Oregon State – had probably its best season in 15 or 20 years this year and still not really relevant on the national scene. So I think for him, he kind of gets out of anonymity, gets onto the front page of, of college football, even if he'll just be in some ways a glorified onlooker. So I think it's a great pickup for Ohio State, and we'll see what kind of dividends he can pay for him. Yeah, as Steve said, this is I, – I don't know if you can hit a home run – in the portal looking for a fourth string quarterback, but you get a guy who is what a seventh year guy has all kind of, had all kinds of offers coming out of high school has five or six career starts in his time has seen a lot. And this is, this is what you get to be your fourth guy. And, and Ryan day ideally wants four scholarship quarterbacks. And he knows it's harder and harder to make that happen nowadays with the portal and the way quarterbacks see themselves. So to get this guy to um, who wants to get into coaching to then become perhaps a, a helper of Lincoln Keenholes when, when they both get to campus, you know, and, and at the very worst could be a number three, if somebody leaves or perhaps even a number two, if somebody leaves uh, and then you've got um, either Kyle McCord and Devin Brown, or you know, one of those guys stay, and then you've got Lincoln Keenholes and uh, Tristan Jebbia there to be to battle for the backup spot. It gives you experience. It doesn't just leave you with a true freshman being your backup if somebody leaves. So it's um, it, it's a little bit insurance, and, and like we know, not all insurance is um, great insurance, but it's it's insurance, and so um, that's basically what he is and. You know, like I was telling you guys before the show, I I knew the name from Nebraska. He 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 redshirted at Nebraska as a true freshman in 2017, and then transferred during the season, I think, in 2018. And that was, I think, probably lost a job to Adrian Martinez at that point. And then then it's like, well, I know I'm never going to play here now because um, Adrian Martinez is a redshirt freshman, a true freshman, won the job, so went off to Oregon State and. Um, I know, was pretty quiet while he was there and did his did his time and you know he ha actually had to sit out a year for transferring. That's how old he is to give you an idea. Of the first time he transferred, he actually sat out the entire year, and now he's free to move. And uh, so, I guess he'll show up in the summer and uh, just you know be able to kind of, kind of hit, hit, hit the ground running. And I'm sure he'll have the playbook well in advance. Now we now we've got guys that transfer. And they they flip before their transfer is even oh. complete, and and so <laughs> we're, we're at that stage now. But uh, yeah, Tristan Jebbia, I remember him from the, the the Nebraska days as well. I believe he ran into Jake Luton, the uh, guy who became a journeyman quarterback in the NFL, uh, like a six seven six eight guy at uh, Oregon State, one of the tallest quarterbacks you'll ever see, and uh, yes. Uh, Buckeye fans, don't be alarmed. Ohio State is not uh, looking to press a five-touchdown, four-interception guy over his career into the starting role. And I, th I think maybe some people lose sight of, and it seems pretty obvious, but while all these big-name starting quarterbacks out there, the Devin Learys and Sam Hartmans are switching teams, that Ohio State, C.J. Stroud, Justin Fields, Dwayne Haskins, all those guys were unproven. JT Barrett, 
unproven when they first were thrown into the spotlight and had to make it happen. You know, it's crazy to think that they've gone through basically three of their four greatest quarterbacks of all time at Ohio State. If if you say JT Barrett and Dwayne Haskins, Justin Fields, and now CJ Stroud, four of their five best, if you want to throw Troy Smith in there. And certainly I'd say they're top three quarterbacks ever, in my opinion, with Justin Fields and Dwayne Haskins and and CJ Stroud. And so now you move on to perhaps Kyle McCord and the expectation to be one of the top five quarterbacks of all time, I think is, is too much for anybody, but that's what Ryan day does with his offense. That's what happens. That's what the receivers you have that you're working with. And so and, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about the expectations of these quarterbacks forever, but that's a lot of pressure. It's kind of like the pressure and the results of the Ohio state head coaches themselves going all the way back to Woody Hayes where you have um, just line after line of Hall of Famers, and the guys that aren't in the Hall of Fame are Luke Fickle and Urban Meyer and, and, and Ryan Day so far. But you've seen all of these guys have been able to win, and uh, you know it's you don't want to be the guy that stops the streak, I guess. I haven't done the math, but I think Urban Meyer may squeak past the 60% threshold for the College Football Hall of Fame. He <laughs> may be able to clear the mark. All right, folks, we appreciate the comments and questions. Before we get to them, I'd like to get kind of the lay of the land from Steve and Tony regarding now that the NFL draft declarations have all cleared, you know, where where do we think Ohio State stands versus what you guys expected these to fall uh, if we go through the offense and the defense? You know, I think it's pretty close to where we thought it was going to be. I think Luke Whipler at center deciding to jump out after two years as a starter was maybe a little bit of a surprise, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, There are six underclassmen who have uh, decided to go to the NFL. That's C.J. Stroud, Jackson Smith, the Jigba. Three offensive linemen uh, with uh, Dewan Jones, Paris Johnson, and Luke Whippler, and then the safety, Ronnie Hickman, they were all what you'd consider to be underclassmen who are are leaving, have, you know, at least one or two years left of eligibility and are leaving for the NFL. They had some guys who turned down some super senior years like Zach Harrison, Josh Proctor, uh, Javante Jean-Baptiste entered the transfer portal and will play as a super senior at Notre Dame. Uh, same with Taraja Mitchell, who who barely saw the field at all this year for Ohio State. He's going to Florida. So <clears throat> again, you know those 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 guys are all gone from the program. Uh, they did get Lathan Ransom back. Tommy Eichenberg, the linebacker, is returning. Uh, Matthew Jones, I think, was a potential at offensive line, and he'll be back. Steel Chambers uh, will be back as well. So and Cade Stover, tight end. So there's five guys right there who contemplated it, but I don't view any of them certainly as first round picks. And if the second and third round are the second day, I think a lot of those five would be borderline second day picks. So I think in their mind, they want to move from the third day up to the second day, uh, move from late round picks to uh, mid round picks. If not, if they can jump into the first round, Mayan Williams is another one who may have harbored a thought about leaving for the NFL. There's only so many miles on a running back's tread. And, uh, you know, he could have made that decision too, but uh, he decided to return as well for a fourth year. So um, I think there's a lot of good there. And as I said, what you have are a lot of guys who are in a contract year. In addition to the five guys I just mentioned who are going to be fighting to move up draft boards, really six if you count Mayan Williams in that group as well. You've also got some potential high-end guys like Marvin Harrison Jr., JT Tui Malowal, Jack Sawyer, uh, who are fighting you know, to get into the first round potentially if uh, they – Mecca Buka as well. So you've got Travion Henderson. You've got you know any number of guys that, uh, that could do that. Heck, we saw Dwayne Haskins leave after one season. Was it – the best decision anybody's ever made? Uh, Probably not. But then again, was Dwayne the kind of guy who was going to go to the NFL and, uh, you know, be able to assimilate 
uh, that lifestyle and, and really the work ethic that was needed uh, to, to be a frontline NFL quarterback. I'm not sure that he is, but if Kyle McCord or Devin Brown has a 3,500 yard year, do one of them decide to jump off after this season? So, you know, that's, that's in the offing as well. If, if one of them were to just explode on the, on the scene this coming year. So, um, I'm not predicting that in any way, shape, or form. I think in Ryan Day's mind, whoever wins this job will have it for two years and lead them to the national championship game twice and, and you know, let, let the chips fall where they may. But um, to me, uh, I think you've got a guy, a lot of guys positioned on this roster who must play well for Ohio State in 2023 to ensure their financial future as NFL players, and that is only – a good thing for Ohio State, in my opinion. Yeah, I think this team is going to look much different after the 2023 season when you have so many guys leaving for the NFL. They were able to keep a handful of guys this time around. I don't know how well they'll be able to do that next time. But one of the, the new factors in this, and Steve is talking about the, the third guys, third day guys who are fourth, fifth rounders, NIL can make them just about as whole as an NFL contract would be for those guys. And so, you know, they can have a couple hundred thousand dollars while they play and and try to increase their stock. So, like, why not do it? And, you know, Tommy Eichenberg and you know, having him back, having Kate Stover back, those two guys are huge for what Ohio State likes to do with their offense and defense. Uh, but losing Luke Whipler, I think, is – I'd say that's more significant than Paris Johnson at this point. And both are very significant, and I, I think they're – I think I've said that they're the – third and fourth true true juniors to leave Ohio State from the offensive line in, you know, 25 years with um, Michael Jordan and Orlando Pace. So it's not it's not something that happens all the time for Ohio State to lose two of those guys in one year. But losing a center like Luke Whipler, who you weren't expecting to, they were expecting to lose Paris Johnson. Now we can say that they did not prepare very well for that Paris Johnson loss. Knowing that it was going to be, knowing that he was likely a three year, three years and done guy, nobody thought that was going to be Luke Whipler's experience, especially as, as a redshirt sophomore. So they've got to do some things. And whether that means moving Matt Jones inside or, you know, Jacob James was the backup this year, I don't know how confident they feel in him. I still think after the spring, you're going to see offensive linemen looking at Ohio State from around the country saying, I could probably start there, especially since there will be people telling them, hey, you could probably start at Ohio State. No, I'm not saying who's going to be telling them that. Who knows who's going to be telling them that? But there's going to be uh, some, some guys that look into the portal, even though they're happy where they are, they could be happier at other places. But, um, you know, I, I think losing Ronnie Hickman, I mean, how, how devastating is that? I think Lathan Ransom could probably p- play that position that you know where is Kai Stokes in this this discussion because he was a backup of free safety to Ronnie Hickman uh, now you're now you're talking about where where is Ronnie or uh, Sonny Styles in all of this can he play so, strong safety and replace Lathan Ransom's role so they've got some moving parts they've recruited well in most places I think the secondary needs to get better I think there there is potential for it to get better and not be as exposed, but I think also part of that is on Jim Knowles to uh, make them make them better and not make put them in, in opportunities to be as bad as they were. But again, it's going to be another year where Ohio State is uh, expected by many, and when I say many, I expected by Ohio, Ohio State fans to be a national title contender. Then they should be a national title contender because that's where the program is right now, and you're not you're not expected to be nine and three. And vying for, I don't know, is, is the Outback Bowl still a thing? Is the Citrus Bowl still a thing? Like, it's been so long since we've had to worry about those things covering Ohio State that I, I assume they're still there. I just, you know, never been my focus. Yes, they're the focus of the Big Ten Western Division <laughs> to try to show up at those games. I think uh, those were filled by Illinois and Purdue this year. We no longer have the Outback Bowl. It's a shame, but uh, it's the bowl's still there. Peace is it clan. Cheese, is it the cheese at cit- cit- citrus bowl now? The cheese at citrus bowl? No, that was the Russell Athletic. Da, 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 da. The Outback is now the Relia Quest. Mm-hmm. Um, Steve's buddy, Brett Beaselbub. 
took his team yeah, there. My guy. <laughs> Peace Clan is asking about offensive line or cornerback play. What is the biggest question going forward? Both. <laughs> well, I mean, offensive line is where the whole program kind of derives. I mean, it just – Urban Meyer said it years ago, it's an offensive line driven program. You've got to move the football. You have got to change field position. You have got to put points on the board. That that's what makes the world go round basically. And um, the offensive line is the, the catalyst for all that. And you've got two pretty good pieces, Donovan Jackson and Matthew Jones it remains to be seen if Donovan Jackson could step out and rep at tackle or if Matthew Jones will step in and play at center. But, you know, at the worst, you've got two studs there that you're going to build around. I think Josh Fryer is ready to be an every-down player. He was the visiting lineman, the sixth lineman that would come in in some jumbo sets. Then what do you do next? You figure out, is this Enoch Vamahi? Is this Jacob James? Is this Zen Machalski? Those are probably three names. And Carson Hinsman, I think, is probably in this discussion as well. I don't have a firm grasp beyond those seven names right there who would even be in this mix. You've got a lot of other offensive linemen on this roster like Trey LaRue and uh, Grant Toutant and uh, 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 I, I don't have it right in front of me, but you know, there's probably two or three other guys. Oh, Tegra Tushbola is going to be probably in this mix. I'd put him with that first group of seven or eight right there as well. So they need to identify what their best five-man unit is, and then they need to identify who their top two backups are. And the good thing about this is they have guys like Matthew Jones who can cross-train and play various positions. And, uh, you know, as we've seen, just because you start at tackle doesn't mean you can't also play a couple series at guard if need be or whatever it may turn out to be. Fryer is a guy who could play guard or tackle, as we've seen. So – uh, to me, this is the fun of what spring football is all about. Justin Fry is going to mix and match these guys all spring, and I'm sure he and his uh, grad assistants will be sitting there charting every drill, charting every uh, interior drill, charting every 11-on-11 uh, uh, 11 11 to see who was uh, having uh, uh, winning assignments on every rep and who wasn't and uh, who can execute what they need to be done. And Ohio State's offensive line this past year was outstanding. The, the year before, other than the Michigan game, they were outstanding. So to me, uh, there's a lot on the offensive line to maintain those standards. And again, as I say, I am completely in the dark on – I mean, we don't get to watch enough practice to know who the coaches really, really, really believe – are are the next guys up. I mean, we see it in the games with Fryer and Enoch Vamahi. He played quite a bit, uh, you know, as well. They kind of split time in the Michigan game with Matthew Jones out. So that's very telling, I think, those two guys, uh, Fryer and Vamahi, and then Michalski and Tegra Tashbola. You know, there's, there's four names right there. So, uh, you know, and Jacob James was listed as the backup center, and, and he did get in there and some mop-up late in games. But uh, – is he really the answer? Uh, we don't know. Is Matthew Jones want to tell the coaches, hey, move me there. That way the NFL can draft me knowing I can play either guard position or a center position if need be. And, and you know, we see with the Bengals, they're down two or three offensive linemen. How important is it to have guys who can cross train and play various positions? I mean, you, you can make a career off of that being a journeyman offensive lineman in the NFL if you have that ability. So um, a lot of moving pieces and parts there, but I, I, I think you got to be excited about where this is going. Justin Fry seems to be one of the top offensive line coaches in the country, and he's going to have his hands full this spring trying to sort through all that, in my opinion. One quick question about Matthew Jones. You guys know better than I do that sometimes one play, a series of plays, a game, small section of the season – haunts a guy and becomes his, you know, tagline with the fan base. And with Matthew Jones, it was the Northwestern game. There were a few series in there and around that game where he got a bit pushed around, blown up, and then suddenly there's an issue with Matthew Jones and then 
the interior offensive line. And I'm not saying that that wasn't the case, uh, but how much do we think that that was overblown in his particular level of play? Well, I think he, he was injured the entire year. And so he was, they were talking about how he, you know, he's still learning to play with that injury and play through it. So that was a, that was an ongoing thing for most of the year at a, a foot thing. And then later in the season, got it rolled over on. So I think had he not been injured, he would not be back. So I think it's the injury that held him back that um, now held him back and then brings him back so that he can show the NFL what he can do. Now you've got an issue where they need him at center, but does he want to move to center for one final year when he knows this is his contract year? He wants to put his best self on tape, and his best self on tape is going to be a guard rather than center, even though – going to center shows the versatility that the NFL likes and Paris Johnson playing guard as a sophomore showed the NFL what, what, you know, what they want to see about the different things he can do. So um, I I expect him to be the center, but I think there's a side that is like, I'd rather just stay at guard because it's what I know. And and he has played center in the past. He has like, if they were, if they were going to lose Luke Whippler for a long time last year, I think it would have been Matt Jones there instead of Jacob James. And Ohio State always has a, a backup center and then the real backup center, and he's usually playing guard at that same time. So um, I think getting him back is – if they lost him, then that, then you're you're really in bad straits. And to go back to the original question, yeah, the quarterbacks are fine compared to what the offensive line is looking like, and you're going to need some guys to step up. And this is where Justin Fry really, really earns the money and um, – We'll see what he also does with the running game. But getting Matt Jones back was huge. And I think the injury is the real reason why he's back. Ryan Dawes, thank you so much for the Super Chat contribution. We appreciate that. Uh, You also had an earlier question that we will get to time permitting. So Ryan is uh, sponsoring the portion of the show where we address the early enrollees. Well, we've got 20 signed in the 2023 class. Yeah, Uh, there's 11 of them if you want me to roll through them. And then also you've got a um, – so, so the 11 are Noah Rogers, receiver, receiver Bryson Rogers, receiver Carnell Tate, tight end Jelani Thurman, offensive lineman. All four of the signees are in Luke Montgomery, Joshua Padilla, Austin Sierveld, Miles Walker, and then the three Ohio defenders, the defensive lineman Will Smith Jr., safety Malik Hartford, and cornerback Jermaine Matthews. And then uh, a walk-on running back from Maslin, Will Troll Hartson, who had some scholarship offers and could have gone elsewhere. And um, also Jihad Carter, the safety transfer from um, Syracuse. Syracuse. Yeah, so so that's uh, that's where they, they've got guys who are going to be in for the spring. And uh, it's interesting to me because Jermaine Matthews, coming in and Calvin Simpson hunt, the other corner that they signed not coming in kind of reminds me of Denzel Burke enrolling early and Jordan Hancock and JK Johnson, not and seeing what happened with their respective careers and how quickly they were able to do stuff. So I think if you're asking for guys to, to uh, look for and, and to see something from, obviously we're all going to be talking about the, the receivers forever, but Jermaine Matthews, I think is one, who could step in and be in that two deep pretty quickly. And then if he's part of that two deep, watch out what happens because this is a a quarterback room that was injured all year in 2022. And if they stay that way, don't be surprised if Jermaine Matthews gets in there and starts making plays. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you on that. Uh, I want to see if Noah Rogers, the wide receiver from North Carolina, is all he's cracked up to be in the same with Carnell Tate. I want to see them out there swapping paint uh this um this spring and really showing people what they're capable of luke montgomery to me seems like a sponge i don't know if you know it's hard for a freshman offensive lineman to come in and make a lot of, uh, a major impact um so yeah I, I would agree with you that jermaine matthews at corner is a guy as an early enrollee that may have as good a shot as anybody to crack the two deep and uh you know, it's a position of need for Ohio State. Certainly, I think uh, they would do well to go back out into the portal uh, whenever the next uh, portal 
a segment opens and go find a corner and probably an offensive tackle. I think those are probably the two areas. And if not, you know, one of them, you know, I continue to beat that drum that you need uh, the great Bill Conley, who recruited for Ohio State for probably over 20 some years as an assistant coach said, you cannot have enough big, strong, fast athletes who will track down the quarterback. And uh, that's an area where Ohio State's been deficient, in my opinion. So uh, you need more Zach Harrisons and JT Tui Maloals and, you know, guys of that ilk and Chase Young and the Bosa brothers. So uh, to me, uh, you know, I want to see a little bit more of that, particularly if Tui Maloal, this is last year, you got to replace him after this upcoming season. So um, I, I want to see more of those guys on this roster too. <clears throat> I think an interesting one is a guy who's not going to be entered into this in the spring, and that's Brandon Ennis, who likely projects to the slot for Ohio State, which means this is a big spring for some of the, the 2022 receiver class, particularly like Caleb Brown, who came in as a slot receiver. And the 2022 guys are in danger of being over-recruited and passed by the 2023 guys. So this is a, an opportunity for Caleb Brown to establish himself as the the number two slot guy, even though having Xavier Johnson back, which is uh, assumed to be the case at this point, that creates some more congestion there. But Xavier Johnson can play anywhere and do all kinds of things. So I think this is an opportunity for uh, Caleb Brown to do some things in the spring. And I would expect him to be another name that you hear. You know, we we hear uh, different guys making plays in practice. He's one of those guys that made plays in practice this year. I think it equated to maybe one catch for like two yards this season. But that second year is when guys really start to produce as uh, or start to blossom more as as receivers. So we'll see. Uh, that's just another name to throw out there who's not an early enrollee, but still somebody to watch in the spring. Tony, the running back is not an early enrollee, is he? The Well, there is there is no running back. There is no running back. Except for the walk-on, Will Terrell Hartson, who is. Oh, he is. Okay. So, and and yeah, he's, he's a walk-on that. out of Massillon. Okay. Who ran for a bunch of yards, but you know, they've, well, done, that, they've done pretty well with their walk on running backs the last couple of years. Obviously, you don't want to live off of that, though. Yeah, that hits to Ryan's question. What does the running back room look like in the spring? And I think you have to understand that, OK, mine Williams was healthy enough to play in the bowl game. Do they really want to put him through a rigorous spring practice? My guess is his contact will be extremely limited. And Trayvon Henderson coming off of a foot surgery, I don't even know if he would be available. Uh, it seems to me he probably would not be for spring football either. So uh, to let the healing process continue. So those Henderson, I doubt, I would assume is out. And Williams would be, uh, you know, only partially available, which really, you know, again, it's spring football. Each of those guys in their third, third year, fourth year, it's really not, not that imperative. Uh, they understand the offense and everything else, but it could be a great spring for Dallin Hayden to continue his progression. Uh, Evan Pryor, to me, I would assume is probably still out uh, rehabbing and hoping to get back. Uh, that, to me, seemed like an eight-month type uh, injury to me uh, when it happened, and I don't think that gets him back for spring. And then uh, Chip Trayonum would probably be there. Uh, not sure what the walk-on who played this year, the kid from up in Youngstown, uh, what uh, what his status would be uh, this year. But Hartrell, it sounds like, would, would be there as well. So Caffey is the guy I couldn't think of, so whether he'd be available or not. But that gives you an idea of, of how limited they are at running back, at least for the spring. But, you know, all things considered, they should have five bodies strong uh, going into the fall. So uh, to me, I think running back is going to be a position of great strength for Ohio State in 2023. Steve, do you expect everybody to be back? I'm not trying to put you on on a spot. Like that's that's those are a lot of guys to have back to keep. Now, not having not having, if Henderson and Williams aren't full go, and I don't expect Henderson to be, and I don't know that you need Williams to be full go. Evan Pryor, like you said, will be about seven to eight months out of ACL injury, so he probably won't be full go. So I think that may be a positive for some guys because they're not in the way. But I think like for Evan Pryor, he would probably prefer to be out there and showing them what what he could do. And the coaches would probably also prefer that as well. But having just Dallin and Chip train him going as the guys, I wonder if it's it's 
more likely to keep all five if three of them aren't full go or if it's less likely to keep all five because you don't have somebody else showing what they can do. And like, does, does Evan Pryor, and again, I don't like pushing people out. I don't do that, but like, does Evan Pryor see what's happening with just chip and Dallin and say, we're, you know, knowing that what's going to happen with Mayan and Travion, like he sees these two guys getting all of the work and he's like, you know, what is there for me? I think these are all things that Tony Alfred is just constantly talking to his guys about, including you know, a year ago, people thought Mayan Williams was going to leave. And we talked to Alfred maybe before the season or after the spring, after this past spring, he's like, I had Mayan on lockdown. He wasn't going anywhere. Sounds like they had to get, you know, Travion Henderson locked in again. And so these conversations are always going on behind the scenes. I just wonder uh, at what point, how many running backs is too many and they want five and they like having five, but liking and wanting, it doesn't always match up to reality. I think Henderson and Williams will be there. I think that uh, they understand uh, kind of like uh, Hunt and Chubb for the Browns. They are a, a dynamic one-two punch when they're both healthy. And uh, one really didn't get in the way of the other. Uh, they complemented each other pretty well, I thought. So um, I can't, you know, I can't imagine one of them leaving. As you said, Williams seems like he's ingrained in the program. For him not to have gone pro kind of spoke volumes. So um, I think those two are the are, are will be back, and they're the two that matter the most. I mean, the rest of them are nice players, including Hayden, who I thought answered the bell tremendously against Maryland and Indiana at the end of the year, and even ran very hard against Georgia uh, in the limited opportunities he got. Uh, they were gang tackling him and, and roughing him up, and and he just kept coming back for more. So, uh, you know, I like Hayden. I think Hayden long-term uh, could have a pretty high ceiling. Is it as high as Travion Henderson's? I don't know. But, um, you know, I like what I've – I like everything I've seen out of Talon Hayden so far. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, Peace Clan asking, you know, why wouldn't Henderson or Williams be full go? Their injuries weren't catastrophic. We're just projecting, you know, there was a foot surgery for Travion, so do they want to push him? Mayan Williams, you know what you have. So is this the 2000 rep club that Urban Meyer talked about where you just – you take it easy on a guy because what are you going to get out of him? What are you going to get out of Mayan Williams in the spring that you don't already know you have unless you just want to give the defense some work against him? So that's that's really all we're talking about. We deliver Buckeye Talk thanks to these two and Kevin Noon each and every Wednesday, typically 11 a.m. Eastern time. Lock it in with a subscription right here at the Voice of College Football, Ohio State. Hit that bell for the notifications. You know when we go live that way, which again, typically Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern time. Sometimes we've got to switch it up and follow these guys to their respective platforms. Tony, let us know what you got going uh, on your various uh, platforms and uh, projects here. Yeah, right now at uh, BuckeyeHuddle.com, just going through and, and writing about the guys who are leaving and, and how they're going to replace them in terms of the starters. Uh, I've done, um, you know, Paris, how, how, how are they going to replace Paris Johnson? How are they going to replace C.J. Stroud? Um, I'll be dropping a how do they replace Cam Brown today. So it just gives you a look at what's coming and what to expect for the spring and then uh, who I eventually think will win the job. So that's what you can find at the BuckeyeHuddle.com right now. Steve, what have you been up to recently? Oh, you know, I, I dropped that story, as I said yesterday, which was really well received. I, I took uh, 10 of the way too early top 25s now that I just had a minute to come up for air and, and breathe a little bit. And that took a little while to put it together. But some great insight and opinions, I thought, on Ohio State. And reading the comments, you could tell how much respect – has returned for the Ohio State program based on the fact that they took Georgia to the 59th minute and the 57th second, you know, of that game until it was decided. So I think that, uh, you know, as, as uh, one one guy said, uh, they, they almost beat the colossus of the sport right now, you know. So uh, you got to give them their props and that Ryan Day has earned his place among the elites. And – you know, what a far cry that was from what people were saying about Ohio State after they got drummed by Michigan. So, you know, this is a case where a close loss, you know, it's certainly not as good as a win, but, uh, 
you know, very, very close to the props you'd get had you won the game. So uh, I think people are putting the respect back on Ohio State's name. So I think that was important to see. And yet, you know, going in to uh, 2023, it looks like there are five teams that are cut above the rest, and that's Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, Michigan, and believe it or not, Pennsylvania State is getting some huge, huge top five run, and three of the top five teams could be in the Big Ten East. Just imagine the three heavyweight collisions they're going to have when you know Ohio State plays Penn State and Michigan, and Michigan and Penn State play each other. Those are going to be three of the heavyweight games of the entire season, it seems like, this coming year. And uh, so uh, those are going to help decide and shape uh, the, the the playoff format. If it was a year from now, you'd be talking about how all three of them are shoe-ins for a 12-team playoff. But uh, as it stands, uh, you know, we saw this year Ohio State and Michigan both made it. I think that's the goal for 2023 for both those programs is to get into the to the final four and for Penn State to uh, to finally they haven't made a playoff yet uh, for them to take that next step I mean they they did win um, the the bowl game that they were in obviously uh, with uh, James Franklin and uh, you know he's won another New Year's six game at least two New Year's six wins for him and uh, you know is he ready to to carve his name up there among the elites in uh, college football? He'll have to do it with Drew Aller now as his quarterback instead of Clifford, but he's got a good nucleus around him. And uh, we'll see, uh, you know, what uh, what comes of that. But uh, to me, those were some of the interesting things that came out of, of putting together that story. And that uh, obviously everyone thinks that Georgia is now the uh, the team to beat. So there you go. I'll throw this out to both of you because I was looking at uh, my DraftKings for fun app. You know, uh, the, now that sports betting is fun and legal in Ohio, looking at the futures for for next year, not next year's national champion. I was looking like I could put fifty bucks on Ohio State and Georgia and Alabama and feel pretty good about it because. Georgia as the favorite, if they win, that 50 bucks pays 180 bucks. So it pays for my all, all three of my bets. So then I've got three other like $10 bets that I could throw down. So I'm thinking like LSU, USC, and maybe Texas A&M because the payout would be huge. But like where else are you going to go? Yeah. Or, I mean, I think those three cover it, those top three. Like are you going to take the three or are you going to take the field? And then of the field – who are you taking? So I think, you know, I could throw down $180 and feel pretty good. that I'm going to break even at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe hit a big one. Um, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to promote sports gambling because as a reformed gambler, I I've, uh, I've tried to tried to stay away from it, but, um, uh, you know, I did take advantage of some of the free money to, to try and, you know, beat these sports books out of their $200 promo budget on me. And, um, you know, I found myself sweating out the over under on the Cincinnati or not the Cincinnati, but the Tampa Dallas game on Monday night, it was 45 was the over under. And it looked, at least that's what I had. And it looked like for, Ever it was going to go under because Tampa couldn't even get a first down. And then Tampa scores two touchdowns, you know, late in the game. It's 31 14. So you get a push on that. But that all of that anxiety came back from all those years ago of, you know, that clock is not moving fast enough. What is going on here? And then you had the break with the player uh, who went down with the injury, you know, a 10 minute break, you know, and I hope everything's okay with him and the receiver from Tampa who got crunched and, and all of that anxiety, you know, your heart's racing a little bit. And I've got, you know, $10 of promo bet money riding on this, <laughs> trying to get a $50 parlay or something. And, you know, it just, all of that anxiety came back. It, you're really better off without it to be honest. That's, that's kind of what I've come around to it. And my mind is reconciling that I remember these feelings and I didn't like myself then, and I don't like myself now for 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 being part of this. So that's my that's my don't do it uh, uh, sermon of the day. I just have the personality that I'm either all in on something or I'm not, 
and there were two consecutive Major League Baseball season about six or seven years ago where I was tracking. I, I thought I had a system. I was tracking every game, and I couldn't go to bed if it was 2 o'clock in the morning and I knew the Padres and the Giants were 1-1 in the eighth inning on the it's West still Coast. still pending, you know? yeah. I just because that that might be the difference between eight and seven and nine and six today. So I I, I there's no way I can I can let that one ride. I, I got to sit only, here and look at my phone and for the final. The only system I ever heard about on baseball, I'm sure there's a lot of them, was a buddy of mine. He didn't bet a lot on baseball, said that if a team wins three games in a row, they are liable to run that out to four five, six, seven games. Pretty when te- baseball teams get on a roll, they they tend to keep that going at least another few games. Now they're not going to win 10 or 12 in a row because that's, you know, almost unheard of. But if a team gets to three in a row, watch them because they can catch fire and and win real off six or seven in a row pretty easily. But that's about the only advice. And I don't know if that's true or not. My my team, the Reds certainly doesn't uh, subscribe to that theory. They never win three in a row. So how would, how would I know? Yeah. They don't get that started. Yeah. You know what's funny? You take a team like the Reds who, um, you know, won 60 games last year or whatever it was, and if you uh, play a team every day all season long, you're going to lose your shirt, you know, just because there's just – it just isn't going to work out. You have to pick and choose your spots. So, um, you know, even with them being, you know, a plus 200 underdog someday, you know, you're not going to win enough of those games to to come out ahead on a team like that. So – it, uh, you know, that's my again. My advice on baseball is, don't get hooked into betting every game every day because you're you're going to lose. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It. Uh, I will say there was a uh, there was an Indiana basketball game at Penn State the other day, and Penn State had to give them like three points. And here, Penn State has been as mentally tough as any team in the country this year and having one of the nice surprise seasons in the country. And Indiana is about as mentally fragile, mentally and physically fragile. They're down two starters also. And they're like catching three points at Penn State. I'm like, no way. Penn State's going to win that game easily. They won by 19 points. So, yeah, I uh, when I see, as Stevie Winwood said, when you see a chance, take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. When you see one that just doesn't make sense, hammer it. Well, I think the novice gets pulled in a few different ways. In baseball, they see Clayton Kershaw is on the mound. The Dodgers are, you know, got the best yes. record in baseball. You got to play that game. Well, your payouts, you know, 40 cents on a dollar bet, you know, something like that. So that doesn't, you know, in the long run, you start to add those up. Man, you got to hit like 75 or 80 percent of those. I mean, you no, that's that's a losing then, proper proposition. Somebody squibs one through the right side of the infield, and you lose two to one in the tenth inning with the ghost runner scoring from second. You had to overpay to to get the, you had to put down fifty to try and win thirty or something. I mean, it just yeah, the hell with well, that. I, I had one. And we don't need to continue on this. The Cavs. I, I I put one of my free bets on them last week, and down the stretch, I had them on the money line. And down the stretch, they gave up a seven point possession. To, to cost me uh, like a four or five light leg parlay. I got seven point possession. Come on. I mean, stay away he from the NBA. That. Joel Embiid last night cost me. I bet him a double double and he finished with 41 points and nine rebounds. And I, I'm just, I'm done, oh. with it. done with it. Yeah. Trade in some of those points for a couple boards. Yeah. He didn't need that. He just hangs out by the three all day long. It's infuriating. That's what I get for the, you know, I, I don't watch the NBA. So, but that won't stop me from putting free bets on it, you know? Hey, well, Mark. I think the, Oh, go ahead. Go I ahead. was just going to say, I think the other thing that people get caught up in is they, they some magically believe that the bigger the game is, the the more there is a need to bet on the game when <laughs> that's not where the value is. Just because it's the Super Bowl doesn't mean you need to bet on this and put more money on this game because it's a bigger game. You know, the, the Pirates and the Brewers playing at noon on Thursday might be a better play for you. You know, that just because it's a big game doesn't mean you put a lot of money on it. I, I, I have basically figured out now where the games are. That's the bigger question. But if you look at the college football top 25 each week, and there's roughly 19 to 22, 23 games, something in that range, a quarter of those games, like clockwork, 
are going to be upsets, are going to be money line upsets, four to five of those games out of those 20. So you just need to find them. Mm-hmm. And if you can hit on two out of five, you'll probably win money. Yep. Yep. That's a good point because uh, there was a day here just this past week in college basketball may have been Saturday where 19 ranked teams were in action or something like that. Seven of them lost maybe to unranked teams. And then there were two games in the big 12, I think matching ranked teams, but uh, seven, I think seven ranked teams lost to unranked teams. So there is a lot of parity out there right now uh, with college basketball and we're seeing it in the big 10. I mean, every one of these teams is going through Ohio state's lost four games in a row and they're playing Nebraska tonight. And Nebraska is close, as close to rock bottom as it can get. Of course, Ohio State lost to rock bottom Minnesota at home just last week. So Ohio State's kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel right now. And this is an absolute must win for them tonight. I wrote about that on our site, you know, for today as well, that this this is the day to put up or shut up. I mean, either this or, you know, start planning for next season because you know, the NCAA is, seems like it's going to be a uh, – uh, not much of a proposition, but um, the parody in college basketball, I mean, Illinois went through a bad stretch and has now come out of it. Wisconsin went through a bad stretch and has come out of it. Indiana has been through that bad stretch like we talked about, and they're starting to, you know, at least win their home games again. So um, every team in college basketball is going through this, uh, and, you know, it's how you come out of it, you know, the other side. And I think, you know, from just speaking about Ohio State, they need to come out of it tonight. One quick note about this Georgia game, Steve, and, and you made mention of your um, compilation of the t- way too early top 25s and what some of the analysts have to say about Ohio State and being impressed with that effort, which we all should be. You know, are we going to be here in 10 years? And is that just going to be a footnote? Is that going to be Aaron Boone knocking the Red Sox and killing the Red Sox again? But the next year they made it all good. 2004 hit and they wiped out the three zip lead and all was good. And it was just a footnote versus Bucky Dent. And it just seems like it's going to last forever. Is, is that just going to be uh, a game in which Ohio state should have had, but it's just in the long line of continuing to get to the playoff, which they should in the 12 team, but be a serious national championship contender, or is that going to be, wow, that one got away and they haven't recovered since. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you think about Ohio State broke Miami with that Fiesta Bowl 20 years ago, and Miami hasn't been a factor really in the national scene yet. Ohio State broke Clemson two years ago in the semifinals, and the last two years have been total, utter disappointment for Clemson. So is the Georgia game going to be the one that breaks Ohio State? I don't know. Um, We've talked about it on the show that when you didn't win a national championship with two of the better quarterbacks you are ever going to have Justin Fields and CJ Stroud, uh, you know, what quarterback are you going to win it with? That's, that's a, that's a tremendous question in and of itself. So um, somebody on our message board posted next 25 years, how many national championships does Ohio state win? Obviously they've won two in the last 20 years, but you have to go back 34 years before that. So, and obviously it's a different sport even than uh, you know, than when Woody and, and Earl Bruce were roaming the earth there in the 70s and 80s. But um, <clears throat> to me, uh, I think Ohio State's going to be in the mix, and they'll, they'll break through and they'll win. I would, If you had to give me an over-under, I'd put it at two and a half in the next 25 years or 20 years. Two and a half is probably a solid number because the, the thing kind of recruits itself. If Ohio State can just get – some impact players from the state of Ohio, more Jack Sawyers, more Luke Montgomery's, uh, maybe Montgomery's younger brother, Ryan Montgomery, turns out to be the quarterback that they win it with. And I just <clears> – <throat> I don't even know that they're going to take him. I don't even know that he's going to end up at Ohio State. I'm just throwing his name out there. You know, they got to catch some magic. You know, they need a – a a uh, a Troy Smith, you know, that, you know, somebody, a Cardale Jones, you know, somebody, a charismatic figure from Ohio, uh, you know, a Claret, uh, a Mike Doss, you know, that type of character, that type of Ohio is going to win against all costs type guy that 
that's not really been in this program here in, under the Meyer regime. So maybe you get back to the roots a little bit and maybe that's what finally puts you over the goal line is to have half your starters from the state of Ohio and Ohio football to, to uh, contribute to it. But we're seeing a lot of things within the state of Ohio that have kind of contributed to that because they are debating about allowing the guys to do seven on seven and maybe instituting spring football in the state of Ohio. Maybe Ohio would produce better players if there were spring football practices in Ohio and they allowed the guys to go off and do seven on seven in the nine months when it's not uh, – September, October, November, you know, allowed them to go off and do unlimited seven on seven like they do in Florida or what, whatever the rules are in those other states. So maybe that would help with the development. You get better players out of it. But Ohio always has to be the backbone of what you do or has typically been the backbone of the better teams Ohio State's ever had. You know, I'm, I'm just looking here at the – Steve, you're talking about the quarterbacks that Ohio State has gone through and, and not won it with. I think the only five-star quarterbacks that have won a national title in the last – in the CFP era – can you guys Lawrence. Can, It's Lawrence and Deshaun Watson. You know, the last wow. two have been Stetson Bennett, then three-star Mac Jones, then Joe Burrow, who is the number 280 player in the nation. And and then you get into the, the Clemson stuff and, uh, you know, Alabama won it in there. They didn't really have any five-star quarterbacks until, like, Bryce Young, and uh, if I'm thinking correctly off the top of my head, again, c- confirm that I am wrong. But Jalen Hurts, I don't believe, was a, a five Tua, but I, he didn't. Um, he didn't. I don't think he won one. But but again, like relieved in one one, didn't he? Yeah, exactly. he did again with Jalen Hurts. But Hurts started all season, and then you know, I, I think we, we've seen. And you look at who has won an, a national championship for Craig for Ohio State. It's Craig Krenzel and Cardale Jones. And I was putting together you know, the other day, people talking about CJ Stroud's legacy and he didn't beat Michigan. And you look at the numbers he put up against Michigan. And, and then in 2001 and 2002, Craig Krenzel beat Michigan as a starter. 2001, he was 11 of 18 for 118 yards. 2002, he was 10 of 14 for 124 yards. Um, in total, in those two games, 21 of 32 for 242 yards, did not produce a touchdown pass or a touchdown run. They scored 40 points total in those two games, but he beat Michigan. C.J. Stroud didn't, and and this is this is how we want to measure a starting quarterback, unfortunately. Um, but I, I do think, uh, and I I think this is like it's a game that will live in infamy for Ohio State, like the 2019 Clemson. But it doesn't break them; it and it, it motivates them to beat them the next year because there was a lot of focus on Clemson in 2020, all, all season long, and, and in the off season as well. It was Clemson and it was COVID. That was basically the two two big topics around Ohio State. How about our guy Kevin Warren? Did the, I texted Tony a picture of him meeting with. Uh, Justin Fields and, and shaking his hand in the workout room at the Bears and and what that conversation had to be like. Remember when I tried to screw you all over? <laughs> yeah. Remember when I tried to cancel your season? Yeah, and, and as a Bears I'm fan, I want now, to bro. I'm with yeah. you now. Yeah, I'm exactly. Down for the cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he got out of the Big Ten as as quickly as he could, and and again, I I can't fault anybody for leaving the college game right now. Oh, it's a disaster. And, it's a and disaster. that's that's administrators, that's coaches. I know recruiting I'm departments. I'm about, I'm about ready to jump <laughs> off of a bridge. But like recruiting departments who do all of this work and then just have somebody come in and steal their guys with NIL. Like there are people Buy leaving that yeah. that industry as well. So uh, somebody needs to get control of this at the the, the, the next head of the Big Ten. The, 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 the current head of the NCAA needs to uh, start cracking down on, on whatever they can crack down on if there's anything that they can crack down on. Yeah, Warren came in and did his damage. And and I say that in respectfully. Uh, he got them <laughs> this, this record-setting television. I, I, I mean it both good and bad. Yeah. He uh, got them this record-setting television contract and also brought in USC and UCLA. And I don't like the USC and UCLA thing as a, quote, 
traditionalist who's followed the sport since the seventies, but um, I see where the, I see where the puck is headed type thing to where with the internet and with, you know, television nationwide coverage and different things like that, that, that it's, it is truly, as my friend Todd Jones from the Columbus Dispatch said, when we were bemoaning the fact that NCAA tournament game was being played at eight o'clock on a Sunday night when the kids had class the next day and had been out of class for five days prior to that, it's all a television show as we, as we, and Mark, that's right up your alley. You're a TV guy. So, but uh, it's all a television show. And, um, you know, the, the sooner we all come to grips with that, the, the better it is. They need to start paying the actors what they're worth to put this television show on. And maybe that'll help alleviate some of the growing pains that we've got uh, with this sport right now. But um, he set them up for the next 20 years with that television deal and with USC and UCLA. So, you know, history may not look at him kindly for what he did in the fall of 2020, but everything he's done since then has been a home run. And, you know, if he makes five or 10 million, I assume the bears are going to pay him 10 million probably to be their president or whatever. Um, I would go with Mark Silverman. He is such a bright guy. I don't know, Mark, if you're aware of him, he was the head of the big 10 network and then is at Fox networks now as a big wig there. He knows where all the bodies are buried in the big 10, obviously started the big 10 network in 07. He is such a bright guy from the few times I've dealt with him. He's a guy I think, uh, that would do a great job as the Big Ten commissioner, even though his his background's more in television than in college athletics. But again, it's a television show. You're a television producer now more than you are a commissioner of a college sport or you know dealing with student athletes and coaches and athletic programs. So they're they're just they're just props on the set at this point. <laughs> so, I don't know. That's the guy that that knows the landscape that. Uh, that I would, I would, I would trust to take it over, but I'm sure the presidents will put their heads together, and, and somebody will come up with somebody. Somebody said Gene Smith, but you know he's 66 years old, and, and this is an entirely different level at this point. You know, he has done outstanding as the athletic director of Ohio State, but you know, is this an area where he can go in and hold his own with? you know, his counterpart at the SEC or the ACC or whoever it may be, um, you know, that's that remains to be seen. So play hardball with, uh, you know, whoever he needs to play hardball with. I, I don't know. I don't know if I see him in that role or not. Well, like you, my report card on Kevin Warren was the fall of 2020 was completely botched on so many levels that we talked about at the time and don't have time to talk about now. But since then, the two big coups are obviously USC, UCLA to counter Oklahoma, Texas to the SEC. And that is as good as the Big Ten could have done, even though that's completely out of the box thinking. We all were kind of connected to, well, expansion meant geography. Well, they totally broke the mold when it came to that and brought in two big powers, recruiting location, TV market. That was a great move. Uh, even though, like you, Steve, I would love to see college football go back to a regionalized conference setup, but we're way past that. And so that was the move to make. And then the brilliance of the TV deal was that it's in an NFL mold it covers multiple it's not just we made a deal with espn no made a deal with fox nbc and cbs we're covering the entire landscape if you flip it around on saturday you're going to run into the big 10 all over the place and we're covering all these um time zones as well so it was a brilliant television deal uh from kevin warren so he has made up um from the botched uh, charade of the fall of 2020. All right, guys, we appreciate uh, you making this happen. I hope everybody out there appreciates it as well, because Steve and Tony are on the run all week and they drop by for an hour plus to give us Ohio state Buckeyes talk every Wednesday, Steve, we appreciate it. Tony appreciated it as well. Follow Steve on Bucknuts two four seven Sports. Tony's many platforms at uh, Buckeye Weekly, Buckeye Huddle. Um, how many podcasts this week, Tony? Uh, probably just two this week. Uh, we we dropped one 
on Monday, uh, instant reaction to CJ Stroud announcing his departure where the Buckeyes are going to go from there and obviously answered a ton of questions on the live stream. And look it up right here on YouTube, College Football Playbook. And uh, Tony and uh, the crew over there are doing some good things at College Football Playbook. Otherwise, we'll be back here next Wednesday, most likely, for Ohio State Buckeyes Live. See you then.